Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Could someone confirm that they can hear me? So uh, if someone could just write in the chat box and confirm that you can hear me, I can start uh, this live, I mean, I can continue this live video if it's OK. Um, I'm Nida Mulji, and I am the author of The Love Connection, which is a piece of nonfiction writing um, produced after, written after many, many years of research of universal patterns in parenting across cultures and across um, different societies. I've um, been asked to talk about the inspiration for my book. And all I can say is around me, I saw a lot of disgruntled adults without a connection with the rest of the world. A lot of teenagers who were angry and anxious and didn't have um, a role to play as global citizens didn't have that same connection or a sense of belonging with the world. And it occurred to me that just like charity, um, that connection with the world starts at home as well, just the way charity starts at home. The love connection is what I call it because it starts with the love that you get from your parents and how they eventually become your comfort zone for you to be nurtured and cultivated enough to be able to become a global citizen and find that sense of belonging in the world. So that's actually what inspired the book. I have three children of my own, and I hope to be the comfort zone for them uh, to run to. So I'm going to start with a passage. Um, I'm going to start with a passage from the book, and then perhaps we can discuss it. If you feel like um, asking questions, please feel free to write in the chat box and interject whenever you like. Um, and I'll take the questions as I go along. I just want to talk about how this love connection really works. So children are rolling balls of, em balls of emotion. They're so full of emotion, and it's their parents who actually teach them to manage those emotions. It's a slippery slope in the sense that we don't want quiet, underconfident, compliant children. But at the same time, um, we don't want to create fireballs of emotion that don't know how to manage themselves. So how do we strike that balance? So here in the passage, it says, it's mainly through meaningful conversations while structured activities will cultivate the skills and talents in children. Meaningful conversations with parents um, normally take a back seat and they're really, really important. The truth is that conversations simply can't wait. Children are fireballs of rolling emotion. And when anything excites, upsets, or frustrates them, they have to let it out. When parents become the comfort zone for children, that uh, for, uh, the comfort zone for children to run to and unload this emotional baggage, they find themselves happier and more balanced and settled. When the emotions linger on and they're forced to wait for an opportune moment to share them, there will inevitably be a domino effect where the emotions have become too much for a child to handle and start spilling over into unruly behavior. And that's when we see power struggles between parents and children. So this book is about cultivating that balance, helping children manage emotions. It is also about uh, helping children play a role in the family so that they learn to play a role later in the world. So they feel valued and cherished um, as if they have a place in the world. That's where the sense of belonging comes from. Um, it's not about, let me also talk about what this book is not about. It's not about discipline strategies. I think many of them really don't work because standard strategies cannot really be applied across the board. Children are vastly different. Families have different kinds of values as well. So it's not kind of like a one size fits all uh, situation. Sorry, uh, Zunaira Danish, I'm looking at your comment. There is a climate stories book, a combined effort of Pakistani kids around the globe will be available in market just after E. Thank you for letting us all know about that. My book is also available at Liberty Books. And just like Away said before, if you would like me to sign it for you with a personalized message, please reach out on um, my uh, 
Twitter, which is Nida Mulji, or reach out to me on Facebook. You could also reach out on LinkedIn or Instagram and let me know if you'd like the book to be signed. Um, there is, if you would like to ask any questions before I proceed, please put them in the chat box so I can take the questions as I go along. I would also like to talk a bit about how this love connection is established. So we have children coming into the world. And of course, it's for those of you who are parents, you would know that it's one of, uh, you know, the kind of elation that you experience is um, there's no substitute for it. To me, there's no substitute for it. It's one of the most precious emotions that you will ever experience in life, um, having a newborn in your arms. And then as the weeks come along, it gets a bit exhausting. You feel like you're working way beyond your capacity, but the love also spills over. You have this intense love that you feel for this child that has come into the world through you. How do you manage to, to um, express this emotion? We do it through physical hugs and cuddles. We do it through feeding children and taking care of their needs. We also do it through taking care of their emotional needs, helping them feel um, as if they're important to us. And they are. They're very important to us. How do we get this love back from them, though? You might, you might be thinking you're giving a lot of love. Is your child receiving that love as well? Are they imbibing that feeling, that intensity of love that you feel for them? How, does, um, how, do, how do we achieve that? In my book, I uh, through research, because I've spoken to many parents who've spoken about you know, their childhood, their, their children's childhood, I've spoken to grandmothers, uh, uh, people of different ages, really. Um, it seems as if those that learn to establish that love connection are the ones who've, who know how to express those feelings of love and affection for the other person. And that really happens, you know, when we say, uh, to our children, I love you, and we leave it at that, or we give them a hug and we leave it at that. Sometimes it's important when the child is really small to ask them to say it back to you. Say, I love you. Do you love me? And if they say yes, they say, say it back to me. Give me a hug. Give me a tighter cuddle. Uh, give me a squishy hug. You know, so sometimes we have to teach children how to give love. If they learn to give love within their household, chances are that they will be in a better position to give love outside of their household as well. This book also talks about um, dealing with children's uh, lack of capacity for managing their emotions and how to go about uh, teaching them to do that. Well, as adults, we've got, we have a really hard time as well. So we've got to learn to manage our own emotions first and model that for the children. But more than managing our own emotions, I think what's important is letting children have a, um, uh, the, the space, the airspace and the time to talk about how they feel. Engaging them in conversations is the primary method to me, um, and it's discussed in detail in this book, is the primary method to understanding the process of your child's thoughts and helping them weave a way out of those imbalanced or agitated emotions that they might be feeling. Um, a two-way conversation always helps when children get to vent that they find themselves in a better um, position and they feel like somebody is looking out for them, somebody is giving them that time and love to help them manage their emotions. Another aspect is this, of this book is about nurturing children and cultivating them. How do we do that? How do we help them feel valued? One way of doing that in the previous generations would be to just give them household chores and then the mothers or the fathers would be doing household chores with the children so that the whole family worked together, and that was a love connection. Those are the building blocks of how a family comes together. Uh, nowadays, we have very little of that. We do have it, but it's not like we're using our children as farmhands, and it's not like the children are, you know, too many of our children are washing dishes anymore for us. There's no reason not to, but it's just that, you know, they have their structured activities and they have their schedules to, to, to manage. And we don't always ask children to do household chores the way they used to be asked in the previous generations. Activities that are done together are a great bonding um, mechanism as well. So whether it means playing board games with children, whatever we do in a group, 
um, helps, whether it's playing board games or taking them outside to play football and playing football with them rather than leaving them to coaches and teachers. And if you um, engage them in anything, any in any um, skill-based activities such as knitting or stitching, embroidery, cooking, baking, anything at home that you do with them rather than leave them alone to it would be a great um, nurturing activity. Besides nurturing and cultivating children, what else can help children feel valued as part of the household? Well, if you think about why children love video games and uh, why they play video games all the time, the momentum is fast, yes, and they're also competitive, but sometimes they're not multiplayer. They're playing individually and they're still loving it because that game allows them two things. One is decision-making skills. So as they go along up one level, they keep making decisions very, very quickly. And the second thing that games allow is for them to benchmark themselves against themselves and no one else. So if they lose, there's no one standing there and saying, I told you so. They can just try again or re-begin the game and play as many times as they like without judgment. That kind of element is missing in our relationships with children now. So there is one I feel, and I'm making a generalized statement, um, I feel there is a lot of judgment. There's a lot of I told you so, and don't do this, and don't do that. So more negativity than positivity. Um, and, that, and, and that goes against um, helping children feel valued in their households. And the second aspect of it is um, the decision making. So if children are given an opportunity for regular decision making from which um, subject they'd like to uh, choose in school to what they'd like to eat or what they'd like to wear, if they are included in those decisions which concern them, then they feel as if their thought processes matter and that they're not just following the um, parents' instructions blindly. So, um, so those are um, the things that my book talks about. And it's generally a very positive narrative. It's told through the experiences of many families, many uh, children and parents. And I discuss, without taking names, I discuss people's experiences, negative and positive. It, there's also a bit about helping children through grief and loss. And that might be especially relevant in these COVID times. Um, it, it's a book that you could perhaps also read out to your children if they are uh, you know, within the ages of, say, 5 and 15. You could read passages from it, and they might relate to it. And you could discuss it together with them as well. So it's a fun and easy read. It's available in Liberty Books. Before I sign off, I would ask you to go pick up your copy and have a personalized message written and signed by me. You can always reach me on social media or you can email me at nida.mulji at gmail.com. It was lovely being here. I hope you all enjoyed that session. If there are still other questions or comments, I would love to address them before I sign off. So I'm having a quick look at the chat box. Um, can unmarried people get something out of your book? Of course, Muhammad Hassan. That's a great question because we are always, we, we're parents to someone or the other. So if it's not our own children, uh, you might, if, if you're not taking care of your own child, you might be taking care of a niece, a nephew. You might be taking care of um, uh, a grandchild or you might be taking care of you know if you're a grandmother and you want to read this or a grandfather you might be taking care of any uh, you know if you're a teacher you're taking care of so many children as well so yes I feel uh, that people who don't have children can also benefit from this book um, Adil Masroor you you want to know about my favorite book on history that would be uh, the murder of history by KK Aziz which I read many decades ago but it's left an impression on me um, and how, you know, historic is because of how historical narratives can be filtered and changed through time. Okay, Aisha Rahman, if I'm not mistaken, your book looks at children not as little idiots who know, don't know anything, instead as little humans 
who are finding their way in a world that is fairly new to them, absolutely. Children, I don't feel that they're empty sponges or empty slates for them to take on whatever comes their way. I honestly believe that they have, uh, they, they're quite skilled, they come with a DNA um, that is fairly structured, thinking processes as well, and they come uh, with high emotions. I feel that they, they have, uh, you know, a, a lot to give from day one in this world. And so, um, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise anyone to think of children as little idiots who need to be told what to do. They, they probably, um, they, they just need love, attention, time, and they need the space to be the individuals that they would like to be. Can you comment on the mismatch between a child's urgent need for conversation and a parent's unavailability? This happens all the time. But you know, as adults as well, Aisha, we always have to take appointments from people if we want to have a discussion and they're not free for us at that time. We always go back another time. So it could be sometimes it can be a little negotiation about what time um, you know you can sit together with the child. Can you come back at four o'clock? Give them a specific time so that they're not waiting endlessly. We have a habit of saying in a hurry, and I know I'm guilty of that. In a hurry, we have a habit of saying later. Can we do this later? A child in their little mind doesn't know what later is. So if you can specify and say, come back at four o'clock, or I will come and find you, give me just a few minutes, um, if it's going to be a few minutes, or it's going to be later in the day, you can say later at night. You know, if the child doesn't yet understand the concept of time, then you can talk about how you will get together after sundown, go by um, the light and day. Um, so children just need specific answers. Sometimes it's a negotiation as well with them, but the the idea is to get that negotiation going through a conversation. Conversations really help. One word answers in one sentence or uh, asking the child to leave you alone, you know, that doesn't work. They need conversations, they need active parental engagement. And then they're okay because they feel like they've had a chance to talk, to vent, to connect. And that is what pacifies them. Later avail uh, uh, yes, later availability might actually mean diffused emotion. You could also, uh, that's absolutely right, you could also for that time being distract. If there is something that you can uh, at that point just stop dead in your tracks and sit with the kid, the kid needs to speak to you. And if you can stop what you're doing and make yourself available, obviously that would be the best option. But if you don't have that option, and they have to come back later, there will be diffused emotion. There will also be filtered emotion in the sense that the child might not feel exactly as they were feeling two hours or three hours ago, but then that's life. That is also a skill that they need to learn. Everybody is not going to be available for them um, every time they need to talk. So these are just lessons in life, as long as parents explain their actions rather than uh, give an answer and expect the child to understand. Uh, okay, Umar, if the car says uh, children need specific answers, they want a respectful yes, no, or later. That's right. They want respect more than anything else, just as adults. They want respect. So age is not a factor for giving or receiving respect. It's how you engage and interact with another person. So if a child is being very kind to you or looking out for your needs and saying, are you okay? You don't look very well. It's uh, It might be... Um, uh, it might be useful to stop and say, you know, that's really kind of you. Thank you for asking. Give them that respect to show that their comment meant a lot to you and that they can also be an emotional buffer for you, not just that the other way around, because children often don't realize how much they do for their parents. They're giving back so much to us. We're not the only ones giving uh, to the children. We're getting a lot back from them and we and we need to vocalize that for them. So when they know that they're important, that they're that they're getting, uh, that their parents are getting a lot from them in terms of uh, love and care, respect, emotional gratification, whatever your children give you, the children need to hear that and get that appreciation from you. Uh, Aisha says, please comment on screen addiction. Now, during the lockdown, that is a battle I have unfortunately lost. My children used to have screen time and um, they used to be, um, so we were uh, learning, teaching them self-regulation. Uh, they knew when they, they were not dictated to, they knew 
when it was time to give their eyes a break, to give themselves a break, and they would put away their devices and then go and do other things. That was how um, we had established, that's a system we had established so that the children learn to regulate their behavior and their screen time. But during lockdown, unfortunately, that's gone haywire. I think the whole world is now on screens and suffers from the same potential addiction. Um, I also think that because they're digital natives, they're substituting the screens for pens and paper. And, you know, we used to be, we used to write for hours with pen and paper uh, when we were small. And I think the children are doing the same thing with screens now. And it's not good enough for them to use the screens to just play games or learn uh, something or the other. They also want to leave a digital footprint. They want to do things. They want to make videos. They create all their artwork, all their thought processes, all their creativity, all their critical thinking skills, problem solving skills is all focused on the screens. It's all pouring into the screens. So there's a lot of multitasking going on and they're doing a lot of different things with the screens. I don't think screen time, especially during lockdown, is a bad thing. I think what they're doing on the screen and how long they're doing it for, rather than how long they're doing it for, what they're doing on the screen is really important. So yes, if they're playing a mindless game for five hours at a stretch, we need to intervene and give them alternative uh, things to do on the screen. But if, um, but if they're creating, if they're putting good use of skills on uh, during screen time, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? It is something most parents struggle with. You know, a lot of uh, parenting issues are universal, and and and. and most parents struggle with similar things. Most parents have similar kinds of you know, joy and gratification as well. It swings both ways. How to deal with kids who are hyperactive and demand parents to be there for something. For instance, see a drawing, play a game, see the chat, cat with me, how to make sure the reply no is not hurting them. That's really, really interesting because there is some research on the carousel, you know, when children sit on those horses or those um, donkeys on the carousel, the merry-go-round, and they go round and round. And parents have stood there and watched one round. There's research to show that the child will wave and call out to the parent or just wave every time they go around. And they expect children to wave back every single round. And that those might be like 10, 15 rounds. But sometimes you just have to stand there, nod your head and smile and look excited or be excited for every single round. Um, this depends really on every child's personality. Some children really want to be constantly engaged. Some children are OK being independent. They've learned it maybe really early in life by, you know, if they've had a younger sibling uh, early on in life, they might have learned to play by themselves in the room and they won't ask you to look at them as often as a child who hasn't had to make that way for a younger sibling. But yes, they do ask for a lot of uh, engagement and um, it's, it's the only way I can think of offhand and yes i'm sure there's more detail in the book but i've been uh, in this situation uh, many times the way to do this is to distract them i've watched you once i'm going to ask you to do this now and then you know switch their activity so that they can um, so that it gives you a break because sometimes they want us to be there watching them or doing something with them or you know if it's clay then making something with them constantly i understand what you're saying but the idea is not to tell them off not to be abrasive the idea is to be kind and if kindness is not working distraction always works for younger kids for older kids you can always reason with them i think i've gone uh, above my time now i will say goodbye thank you very much all for being here this was a pleasure for me thank you Khuda Afis and I hope to keep in touch with all of you.